You know who I think was the biggest winner of the Canadian Grand Prix? It was you. So technically all of us. The gap between Red Bull and the rest of the pack has effectively been halved. There was some validity to the comments that Alonso and Aston Martin were actually procuring. It gives me a lot more hope that in 2024, the gap between Red Bull and the rest could be even closer or completely negated. This was one of the most intriguing races of the year. In fact, it was actually one of my favorites because there was so much going on up and down the grid. I was constantly spamming my Twitter account with loads of commentary throughout the race, which you can follow at LawVSX. I had a lot of fun with it, as you'll be able to tell, as I'll sprinkle some of my tweets within this video. But in terms of winners, of course Red Bull were winners. They won their 100th Grand Prix. Adrian Newey had his 200th victory in Formula One. Max Verstappen won the race. Need I say more? Even Checo was able to recover and pulled off his great antics as the tire whisperer and got back up to sixth and had the fastest lap. But you know who I think was the absolute biggest winner out of all of them? It was Williams. How can you not mention Williams? They were on it the entire weekend. Those upgrades with Albon, they were really good. Christian Horner was saying a lot of things this race, including that they're actually starting their 2024 car development now because they want to get a little bit of a jump on the head of everyone else because they know they're going to be suffering next year. And he was also watching for most of the race, Alex Albon. And I think he was effectively just going like, oh, Alex, yeah, yeah, we got him on the grid. Yeah, totally me. Tell me, thank me. You're, you're, you're welcome, you're welcome. But throughout of it, James Vowles is really proving to everybody that him just being there, making the most out of what facilities they have, which are 20 years out of date effectively, mind over matter, is actually a legitimate phrase in life. They made the call onto soft tires and qualifying at the perfect time, around about the same time as Lando did. And they carried through with it, got a decent qualifying, and Albon was able to stay up in the points legitimately. Albon's defensive moves were absolutely mesmerizing. In fact, Albon is another winner too, of course he is. But the entire weekend, Williams did not put a foot wrong. Yes, of course, Logan did have to retire and he didn't really have much of a weekend. But as far as I'm concerned, that doesn't really matter. He is still learning. This is a brand new track to him and he's in the older car. Until Logan is in that brand new car, I am going to reserve judgment. There is no point lambasting Logan anymore until he is in the same car as Albon. Williams' top speed was faster than even the Red Bulls, which meant that the majority of the grid, their DRS, basically had no effect on Albon. Ocon, George, they could not keep up. They could not get an overtake. Albon was putting everything in the right place. Sorry, I'm absolutely gushing right now, but that was spectacular. Those points that Williams got, those weren't pity points. They deserve them. I think the Williams car now is faster than the Haas and the Alpha Tauri, and nobody expected it. Alonso is clearly another winner, fiery and passionate, and all of the comments that he was saying throughout the entire race week buildup about him being on the podium once more, that Spain was the last time he wouldn't be on the podium, that Aston Martin's upgrades were really, really good, and it would close the gap to Red Bull, yeah. Those were all true. He had one hand tied behind his back because he was having to lift in coasts and save fuel and preserve those tires and maybe go after Verstappen later or hold back Hamilton. And of course, Hamilton is another winner. That streak with that Mercedes car, it's quite clear that Mercedes had built the new upgrades around Lewis because of all of the comments that he was saying over media at the beginning of the season. This was clearly an apology to Lewis. And despite George's mistake going into the corner and damaging one of his cars and he had to ultimately retire, he was able to get back up the field and nearly score some decent points and take the dream away from Albon. And that was a lot more effective than Ferrari were able to do until, of course, the whole safety car chicanery happened and they pulled off their absolute wondrous miracle. And I'll talk more about that later. I've got to give a cheeky mention to Hulkenberg because he managed to put that car on the front row of course, in the gross capacity. He did get that three-place grid penalty for the speeding infringement. And yes, he of course fell back because it's the Haas car. I don't mean to be down on Haas, but this is just a cold hard fact, it's objective truth. They fell back. But Hulkenberg is making that car sing over one lap. They just really need to get over that problem with their racecraft. But Hulkenberg, good job. Good job. I don't really want to say Ferrari were the winners, but you know what, they were. Throughout the entire Saturday though, I was gonna be putting them in the dark bit over there because of all of their stuff with Charles wanting to go onto the softs at the same time as Albon and Norris and them completely going off on it. They're not really sure what to do, vacillating. It was ridiculous. You could clearly tell that the Claire was absolutely frustrated with what was going on. When they made that call to stay out while everyone else was going in, I was just screaming at the TV. 
I was thinking, what on earth are they doing? But you know what? It works. The clown's got some claws here. Woo! Very nice. Leclerc got fourth place and Carlos was right behind him. And they did, in the end, actually end up scoring more points than Aston Martin. And it's probably one of their strongest weekends as an overall team, at least on the Sunday. They really need to get their qualifying rain interchangeable conditions thing sorted. And I want to give a nod to Piastri here. Throughout the beginning of the race, as long as they weren't on the hard tyres, Piastri was doing a really good job. Right at the beginning of the race, he got the jump on Norris and was really showing his best and what he can actually do. He's right up there with Lando. There is really very little gap between the two of them. And of course, he did have his little mishap in Q3 that got the red flag, but everyone's going to have a big crash at the beginning of their career in Formula One. And now Oscar's had it. He can now just put it away and just get on with the rest of his career. No Formula One driver has ever not had a crash. And whilst Lando was struggling with Hulkenberg, Piastri was actually able to get past him relatively quickly. And had they actually been able to make those hard tyres work, I think we could have actually seen Piastri in a really good points paying position. But oh well, them's the brakes for Formula One. But that was a really, really solid effort. And OK, Bottas, you got a point. Good job. Well done. I should at least acknowledge it. Then we got to get to the losers. And the biggest loser, quite frankly, to me, was the CCTV system installed at the circuit de Gilles Villeneuve. That whole thing with missing out the entire thing with free practice one, that was utterly ludicrous. I've never seen a Formula One session be cancelled by something that didn't involve a car. Yes, of course, the initial red flag happened with Pierre Gasly retiring and then having that all issue with the drive shaft. But then it was prolonged by the fact that those cameras just simply did not work. There were complete blind spots all the way up and down the circuit and the FIA, in their infinite wisdom, didn't want to risk any cars being in a completely dark area and then another car crashing into it or maybe even a person getting hurt. I get that. That is absolutely fair enough. But they really need to have some more checks and balances here because this is meant to be the top tier pinnacle of motorsport and having something so small scupper an entire session. Yeah, they of course managed to extend FP2. That was really not a good look. But of course, there are various tweets stating that there was a backup solution to all of it, but even the backup was not working. So it was really a complete farce for all things concerned with CCTV. And going back to Gasly, it was really an anonymous time of it. He really had bad luck with signs. It was really not a good look. Whilst Ocon was able to score some points for Alpine, Gasly is still not able to get the most out of that car. He's had some good moments, but it's quite clear that Alonso was not the problem here with that second Alpine car. That second Alpine car was cursed, much like the Mercedes car. Michael's car in 2012 had all of the problems, whilst Nico Rosberg had a much more stable and solid car and was able to get Mercedes' first win in 2012. Whereas Michael was very lucky to get a podium at Valencia. The rest of the time, the majority of the jinxes and all of the issues with cars came down to him. And I'm getting the same feeling with Gasly and as I did with Alonso last year. I've got to mention Lando. This was not a good time of it. He had that five second penalty for unsportsmanlike behavior, which even I find absolutely weird. It was ultimately down to Lando slowing the grid down. So that means he and Piastri could double stack effectively. But that's not unsportsmanlike behavior. That's cheeky and definitely deserves a reprimand. But unsportsmanlike behavior? No, I mean, Michael colliding with Damon Hill in 94, that's unsportsmanlike behaviour. But Lando slowing down a little bit, <laughs> unsportsmanlike behaviour, <laughs> oh, that's, it's absolutely obscene. You cannot compare those two moments. To use that phrase is incredibly ridiculous. Otherwise, McLaren would have actually nearly had a double points finish. But the point is, is that Piastri showed him up. And that's why he is a loser today. This has been the biggest example to date that Oscar is just putting in the job, Lando's making some errors, and the gap between him and his teammate is far smaller than Ricardo and he. In fact, I think it might be advantage Oscar. Of course, the points don't say that, but in terms of conduct, yeah. Haas are losers. They are not learning at all their racecraft. You wouldn't even know, looking at the final results, that Hulkenberg was in the top five. He fell completely down. And now Williams seems to have leapfrogged them and Haas is in danger of being now the ninth fastest car. Maybe even the slowest car in terms of race pace. That is really, really not a good look. That was completely crazy about what happened. I'm just getting that vibe from Iron Man where Obadiah Staines is 
Gunther Steiner. And he's just lambasting everyone saying, Williams was able to build that car in a cave with a box of scraps. But it's true though. Williams is working with really outdated means and tools and they're able to actually get the jump on everyone. It's crazy. They got hoodwinked by a team which is massively underfunded and underprepared. They were very unlucky with DeVries locking up and slowing down KMAG. Of course, that is very true. But everything else, you really cannot deny it. I'm sorry, Racing Prodigy. I know it seems like I'm being really mean to Haas, but you really just got to look at the facts. Now, the big one, Lance. Why are you putting Lance as a loser? He scored points. Well, it's not me putting him down on the list here. It's his Papa. Papa Stroll, as I've pointed out many times this week, wanted a double podium finish for his team. He felt that those upgrades were valid of a double podium. Well, he was half right. Those upgrades definitely have worked and have restored Aston Martin as being a podium worthy team. That car should really be winning races had Max Verstappen not come into existence. But Lance was just sloppy this entire weekend. I will give him credit, he did score some points. He did get an extra point thanks to Lando's chicanery, so it would have actually been a 10th. He did get the jump on Bottas right at the end of the race, sort of repairing the damage of Baku where he nearly got second place in a Williams in 2017. But the rest of the time, he just looked like a man who's under a lot of pressure and not from external sources, this time from his own dad. In qualifying, he spun out, he impeded people, and he damaged the front wing. It was just a real bad show at his home race. And I'm getting the feeling that Papa Stroll is really, really starting to turn the screw on his son. Lance didn't really show any of his damp track performance like he did in 2020 when he got pole in Turkey. It was just gone. But thanks to his father's comments, anything lower than third is a failure. And sorry, it's just got to speak the truth. But I'm starting to get hyped now because the gap between Red Bull and everyone else is closing and I think it get even closer. Comment down below your thoughts.